Habakkuk chapter 1. I'm going to read the first 11 verses for this morning, though in full uh, disclosure, we're only going to cover the first four. And then we'll do maybe a part two next week with five through 11. But I want to read these first 11 and tell you that one or two through four is Habakkuk speaking to the Lord. Five through 11 is the Lord Yahweh speaking back to Habakkuk. So Habakkuk chapter one, verse one, the oracle that Habakkuk, the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you look idly at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. Oh, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. Verse 9. They, come, they all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. At rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. And then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose might is their God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, sometimes it is... It is It is hard to trust the Lord. Sometimes it's difficult to discern what God is doing. It's difficult to make sense of what he's doing. Sometimes, can we just say without being irreverent, sometimes God just doesn't make sense, does he? Sometimes we're left scratching our head and crying. Are you listening? Do you care? Have you written us off? Have you moved on and left us to wander with no regard? Sometimes we ask that and it seems 2020 (laughs) in the world, but even here in America in particular, it's just one of those times it's really difficult to discern what God is doing. So, for example, there's some of the questions that are being asked today, but maybe not even asked, but argued about today. And not just argued about with Christians and non-Christians, but argued about among Christians. Is coronavirus legit? Or is it all a farce? Is it legit, but then exaggerated for political gain? Should we take the precautions that we're taking? Or are the precautions only expressions of doubt, fear? Should, should I say something when somebody is careless? Should I not say something? I'm free to hug. You're not free to hug. Should I force you or should I look to your interest? Like, these are all questions that are being asked right now. And, and, and we, I guess, we have to say godly people, wise people are on both sides of this conversation. So, maybe it is being exaggerated for political gain. Maybe it's not. It's hard to know sometimes because we get conflicting reports. Oh, my goodness. Government overreach. I'm tired of hearing that. But you know what I'm also tired of? Reckless. People shout past each other. We're no longer listening. We have made up our minds and we don't care what the news is next. We've already made up our minds. Let's move off of coronavirus for a moment because it seems in many ways our country has because the next drama began to unfold about racism. Is it real? Does it still exist in America? Is it truly systemic? Is it truly still a national problem or is it too exaggerated for political gain? So we can't gather, but we can protest. I get why we fight. I get why we're all worked up over these things. 
You think just for a moment, is it possible that true injustice is being exploited for somebody's benefit? Is it possible? Yeah. Is it likely? I'll let you decide that one. Should we join in the protesting? Are we wrong for protesting? Are we wrong for not protesting? Should we say black lives matter? And if we choose not to, but choose rather to say all lives matter, are we now insensitive and we should be shamed into conformity for this mood, for this moment? Christians. And I don't just mean Christians. I mean Black Mountain Baptist Church. We are at times arguing over this. Is President Trump America's last best hope? Or is he just another in a long line of clever, savvy men that abuse power? Because I hear both. And both sides want me to speak out for them and represent them. Maybe he's somewhere in between. Is that possible? Because in the way we address one another, it doesn't always seem possible. I'm right, they're wrong. No, 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 I'm right, y'all are wrong. And we just... We fight and we bicker. And we reflect the mood of our country. Outrage. You know what probably the biggest outrage is in America right now? For those of us that aren't outraged. And I had someone say that to me on Friday. Call me up. We were talking about one of the issues. Not specific to anything I've said today. But this individual was committed to a decision that this church member knew was right. And if we did not agree, wrong. And he could not fathom that I didn't see it exactly the same way. What I'm getting at is sometimes it's hard, isn't it? And sometimes we read the scriptures and we come to a a set of convictions or persuasions. And therefore, we want to make that universal for everyone. But I want to encourage you at some point to read Romans chapter 14. It is in the Bible and it talks about freedom of conscience. So what that means is there will be times that Christians who have read the scriptures that are mature, that are full of the Holy Spirit, will disagree on something. But that's okay because our unity is in Christ, not in some of these other things. And and, never mind. I'm just going to read. (laughs) These are difficult days. (laughs) These are confusing days. Christians are fighting publicly. And whatever God is doing, it's hard to understand. Some days we clearly see his hand. And some days it looks like he has removed his hand. And we have no idea whether or not he intends to re-engage. That's what it looks like. That's our perception. Habakkuk had that perception. Habakkuk ministered alongside of Jeremiah, alongside of Nahum and and Zephaniah around 600 B.C. The northern kingdoms were already driven into exile. There's the small remaining tribe of Judah. Benjamin, they are now in the land, but but, um, the land is is shrinking. Because uh, the Assyrians were not big and bad enough. Eventually, the big, bad, mean old Babylonians or the Chaldeans rose to power. And the moment in which this prophet musician was writing, and by the way, this is a very unique book where chapter one is back and forth between God and Habakkuk. Chapter two is God pronouncing these woes. Chapter three is the poet writes a psalm and it is glorious. But the reason I wanted to study it is Habakkuk was like us, or maybe we're like Habakkuk. It's hard sometimes to understand, to trust God in these dark, difficult days. The, the, uh, the Babylonians had risen to power and they had already conquered the, the, the power to the north, the Assyrians. And next on their list would have been the Egyptians. And so they're marching south. They're going around the land. They're marching south down to conquer the Egyptians. So what it means is in a matter of, of months, uh, we believe, that the power to the north, the power to the south had fallen. And there was one great power above and below Judah. The Babylonians. King Nebuchadnezzar. And Habakkuk is in turmoil. But that's not why he's in turmoil. 
He's in turmoil because he looks at Judah. And he is deeply hurt by their sin. You see, this moment of time came right on the heels of the death of Josiah, King Josiah. And we know Josiah was a good king. That by God's grace, they had discovered the law again under his rule. And they began to reform. There, were, there was holy restoration in the land. But then our King Josiah died. He died in battle. And what did they do? Well, they did what always happens when all we do is give God external conformity without our heart. We do right while it benefits us. And as soon as it doesn't benefit us anymore, we go back to doing the old thing. And that's why so many of us will walk a narrow path for a moment of time, for a season of time. And then we quit. And we go back to our old ways because God didn't have our heart. He may have our hands. He may have our feet. He didn't have our heart. And that's why the, the, the beauty of the new covenant is a new heart. That is, your wanter, your desirer has been reborn, has been fixed. Israel didn't do that. Or Judah didn't do that. They gave God their hands and their feet. And when good King Josiah died, they went right back into their wicked ways. And so Habakkuk here in this moment is perplexed. He's grieved. He's in turmoil. And he says, God, would you allow, why would you allow why would you allow this? Why would you allow sin and rebellion to go on unpunished? That is unlike you and I don't understand. So, so what we see in Habakkuk is a man who knew God, a man who looked to God because life didn't make sense. And I hope that's our heart today. When you watch the news or when you hear the public outrage, you don't get fired up angry, but you get on your knees and pray. You're perplexed by what's happening because you know it's contrary to God and his good will, his good nature. Habakkuk knew the Lord. And he knew things weren't the way God intended them to be. He was concerned. He was confused. So he did the right thing. He went to the Lord and he cried. And he cried. And he cried. How long, O oh Lord? And that's where we have to live. When we're confused, when we're concerned, when we're perplexed, what's the best thing for us? It's not social media, friends. It's not even your phone to call someone. It's to pray. It's to go to the Lord with your grief and pray. So when it seems God doesn't care, go to the Lord to voice your concern. Then be silent. Listen, be humble and receive his word. You don't just go and bark. Bark and then be quiet. And see what God has to say back. So for this week, we're only going to look at verses one through four about voicing our concerns to the Lord. And next week, Lord willing, if he doesn't return and we're able to meet next week, we will pick up in verse five with receive the word of the Lord. So for this morning, voice your concern or cry out to the Lord. The oracle that Habakkuk, this is verse one, the prophet saw, and this is going to be important that he sees this thing. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me, here we go, see iniquity? And why do you, why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surrounds the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Would you agree this is the cry of a man that's broken hearted, grieved and confused about reality? Look, look again at verse two right there. He opens with, oh Lord. How long? So he opens with that covenant name of God. He's not just calling out to the almighty Elohim. He's calling out to Yahweh. His personal, relational God. The God who keeps covenant. The God who these people belong to. How long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you violence. And you will not save. By asking how long. He's revealing to us all these many years later that this was not a one time broken hearted, exasperated prayer. This is something that he had been crying out for a while. That is, this isn't the first time. This is I've lost track of how many times, God. I don't remember how often I've asked you about this. I've cried to you about this. Now, I don't know if your Bible is like my Bible. I'm using again the, the ESV here, but just above verse two, mine has the superficial uh, in, inserted scripture right there, the heading Habakkuk's complaint. You guys have that in your Bible? I hate that. 
And I love the ESV. <laughs> but I hate it because now in our context, complaining is not holy. I hope you would think of the New, the New Testament where it says do all things without grumbling or complaining. Like it would be easy in our context to read back into this moment because that's what we're always prone to do. And we always have to guard against reading our moment back into this moment. No, we got to do it the other way. We got to first get into that moment to understand it so that that moment reads truth into our moment. Is all that makes sense? What I'm saying is let's not put our own meaning on complaint. Let's receive what's happening here. He was not sinning. He was not sinning. He was simply confused. He was asking why righteous Yahweh seems to have no regard for the wickedness all in the land. No more than if you imagine if, you know, I've got more, sin, more, more sons than I can count, it seems. Imagine if one of my sons, uh, you know, had $10 and his big brother had $10 and he went up to the corner store and bought like a bunch of junk food and then came home and stole my next son's $10. And I just sit back like... Do you think that little boy would look at me and say, Daddy, what gives? Why wouldn't you say something? He squandered his money. You're going to let him squander my money now? Do something. Say something. That's all he's doing. That's all Habakkuk is doing. He's broken hearted. And how long shall I cry for help? The reason I go through all that is you and I have a real enemy. That's really good at taking truth from God's word and twisting it and making us feel miserable. And so when we begin to complain, as the ESV says here, or cry out, how long? He may come along and whisper, do all things without grumbling and complaining. And what I'm saying is it's not always sinful to complain to God. It's, it's not always the absence of faith that causes you to cry out in confusion. It may be the very essence of faith. You know who God is. You know what he's like. You know what pleases his heart. You know what grieves his heart. And now you are genuinely, as a child to the Father, confused. Why aren't you doing something? I'm not demanding an answer out of you as though you answered me. I'm just genuinely confused. Righteous God, this is unrighteous. Why? And you know Habakkuk is not the first person in the Bible to cry how long? God is. Do you know that? Yeah. In Exodus chapter 16, the Lord looked at his people and said, how long will you reject me? What I'm saying is Habakkuk's in really good company right now. Habakkuk is not contrary. Habakkuk is knit to the heart of God. He is... Groaning the heart of God. We'll see this later in, in, in uh, the revelation of God. Revelation chapter 6 verse 10. The saints in heaven cry out how long. Did you know that? They have died. They have rested. They've entered into the presence of God. And in that state they still. Revelation 6 10 cry out how long. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That is, do you think the saints in heaven are looking down at all this corruption and going, cool? Or do you think they're indifferent? No, they're broken hearted. With righteousness. With innocence. They're crying out for justice. Brothers and sisters, I wonder, are we crying out with the saints in heaven? How long until God avenges the blood of his people that died to advance the gospel? How long will you let sin and wickedness go on? Let's not remember or let's not forget. Jesus cried out on the cross. And it was his death. It was his atoning sacrifice. That purchased. Or that tore open the curtain. So that we can cry. How long? Because without his shed blood, we could never get close to God. We, 
We wouldn't understand righteousness and justice. We would still be hard and blind. We would be dead in our sin. And Jesus laid down his life to pay our sin debt. Let me even say it more specific, to pay your sin debt. Friends, don't think in general terms. Think in particular, specific, individual terms. He died for you. He died in your place. He took your sin. Gave you his righteousness. And now you, I, all who are repentant, trusting in Jesus Christ alone, can enter boldly into the presence of God and cry, how long? How long, O oh Lord? In fact, I think that's part of God's will for us right now as a church. This season of church life. And I, I hope it's not just one church. I hope it's all the churches. That we would look at the state of our country. We would look at the condition of this world and we would cry. And we would grieve and we would lament and we would weep. I mean what I'm about to ask you. And I hope you would seriously consider this. If the first six months of 2020 are not enough to get our attention, to buckle us down on our knees, to leave our stomach it just turning over and over and over and just being perplexed by what God is doing. If the first six months of 2020 aren't enough to do that, what on earth do you think it will take to get our attention? I'm serious. When will we be brokenhearted and pray? Not brokenhearted and fight. When will we realize what has happened is beyond us? There's no adapt and overcome to so much of this. There, there's no philosophical reasoning to get us out of this entanglement. There's no new political agenda. There's no candidate. There's no science to fix all this. There's a resurrected king. And while we continue to give our hands to these things, we don't pray. And what I'm saying is, when will we weep? When will we lament like Habakkuk? What will it take to wake us up? To, to, to teach us fully, we are not strong. We're lost without him. We're lost without him. Habakkuk woke up. Habakkuk could see the ruin. Look at these words. In, in these verses, violence, verses 2 and 3. And see if this describes our moment. It certainly described his moment. Violence, iniquity, wrong, suffering, destruction, strife, contention. Habakkuk lives in 2020, doesn't he? He lives in, in America in 2020, right? We can copy and paste his prayer. Put it into our prayer journal and not change a word. And it would be so timely and fitting for this moment. And all he's saying is, God, how long until you're God again? How long until you do what I know you are? How long until you act? It seemed he didn't care. And that's our great temptation. God doesn't care. Again, national sin abounds. Sins of, how much time do we have? Flaunting, immorality. You can't even watch regular TV anymore without all sorts of physically immoral, corrupt images, not just being shown, but celebrated. Does it grieve you that sweet, innocent little girls are being paraded around as objects of our physical lust? I mean, preteen little girls. Does that not grieve your heart? See, it's possible we're so dull to it now. We, we've lived in these waters so long that we're no, our, our conscience is dull. And we're no longer outraged at such things. Like 
probably we all hate abortion and we love those who have aborted babies or participated. I hope that would be your heart, that you would want them to be redeemed by Jesus. But some of us, the numbers are so large, it no longer grips us. The numbers are so ridiculous, it's almost like monopoly money. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Babies are being killed every day, but it's not just babies. It's on the far other end. Those with diminishing physical capacity as senior adults are being killed now. All in the name of love. Is that not incredible? This is our nation. I know there's like a generational gap in our, in our nation. I know this. And many in our country still see America as the, as the city set on the hill or Zion or, again, the last best hope of this world. And I get that and I understand that. But I also understand why a younger generation looks at America and says, not so fast, my friend. The hope of the world is the, the nation that aborts all these babies. The nation that champions sexual immorality and celebrates it and, and sends it all over the world. That's the hope of this world. And what we, we as the people of God need to do is say, no, no, no. America's not the hope of the world. Christ is. And so what I'm saying, this is becoming increasingly clear in this moment. Uh, there was a time in American history when to fight for America was to fight for Christ. And to fight for Christ was to fight for America. There were times that those lines were really, really close if that day hasn't passed, I think we can see it on the horizon. And our battle is going to be kingdom world, not right, left, conservative, liberal. Let's just make sure we're fighting the right battle. We're not fighting to preserve something. We're fighting to proclaim something. And just full disclosure, I'm lonely and I'm tired in the fight. And boy, I need all the help. I need fellow gospel proclaimers in this fight. And I'm tired of fighting with people that say we're on the same team. I'm tired. Aren't you tired of that? Preach Christ. And the Spirit of God will be a tailwind to your message. And you preach anything else and the Spirit of God will be a headwind to your message. Maybe... The grief, maybe the trouble, maybe the suffering is so local and immediate that you can't even care about national struggles. Maybe the grief, Habakkuk-like grief and sorrow is through a child or a spouse and you've cried out for years. How long? Keep crying. And don't feel bad that you don't give a rip about national reality right now. You keep fighting for your family. Maybe the pain is so immediate because of cancer or diabetes, coronavirus or something else. You can't care about the drama unfolding in all these American cities. That's okay. Brother, you keep fighting. Don't give in. But I'm sure we all have moments in which we feel like Habakkuk. Why? Does God seem to not care? In verse 2 here with this cry, he uses two different words. The first word is, we would say like a composed, measured, weeping. Maybe picture a, a funeral home memorial service where you're aware of all that's happening around you and you sit there silently and cry. But the second word for cry is not that. It is scream. It is scream until your throat is raw. And your heart may be crying, but nothing's coming out of your mouth because your vocal cords are spent. And that is the prophet. In this moment, as we jump into Habakkuk chapter 1. So he's crying out for help. He's weeping for help. And then he's shouting out to the Lord, violence. And he's done it so often for so long that he's got nothing left to give in his voice. Again, deep anguish with all the wrong. And again, we can relate. How long? How long, O oh Lord? Well, the reason for the suffering, the reason for the suffering and the reason for um, 
uh, Habakkuk being deeply distressed, the reason for the chaos in the land is found in verse 4. And this is so key. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Why was there suffering in the land? And why was the prophet groaning? Why was he broken hearted and confused? Because the law was paralyzed. Be because justice was not going forth. Because wickedness surrounded righteousness. Because justice, when it did go forth, and we would put like justice in air quotes right here, so-called justice, it goes forth perverted. The problem was they neglected God and his word. The law was paralyzed. And what is happening in our land is the result of not knowing God and his word. So I'll ask you, what does America need? God and his word. So again, we're not looking. Some trust in horses and chariots. We're going to trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen? Amen. Some will look to November. Some will look to a Supreme Court bench. And some aren't waiting for November. They're going to act today. And some will trust in horses and chariots. I don't know what you want from me today. I hope you come expecting me to be the messenger of God. Even that corrective word. And I'm saying, let's trust in the name of the Lord our God. Our country needs God. In particular, the triune God of Scripture. In particular, the one who sent his son to be the propitiation for the sins of all that would call out to him in repentance and faith. In particular, the one that when that son ascended, he sent the spirit now to dwell among his people. To give us life, to give us wisdom, to give us strength, to give us hope. That's what our land needs. So these people here, they had their eyes on the Lord for a moment. Josiah died. They looked away and righteousness went away when, they, when, they, when Josiah died. And wickedness walked right back in. The word of God was no longer read. The word of God was no longer feared. The word of God was no longer received as good and wise and profitable. Instead, it was ignored. It was tossed out. It was disobeyed. The law was paralyzed. Justice never went forth. And so get this. Get this. The people ignored or twisted the word of God and nobody cared. Except Habakkuk. And we've entered into the heart. Or maybe we sat down next to a man. And he's showing us how we should respond when the word of God is neglected. Weep. Weep. Cry. Scream. Shout. The reason Habakkuk was in turmoil is because he knew the word of the Lord and the disastrous results of ignoring the word of the Lord. He saw it with his own eyes. The reason he was in turmoil is because he knew the word of the Lord. And guess what? Therefore, he knew the Lord. And he was genuinely hurt and confused. His whole prayer, his whole problem was rooted in a right understanding of God. So you know why we lack outrage sometimes over the right things? We don't rightly know our God. We don't know his heart. We don't know his heart for sinners. We don't, and, and by sinners, I mean what we would traditionally call the wicked and perverted. But we also don't know his heart regarding the self-righteous. The Pharisees had a pretty good gathering, didn't they? A pretty large following. And they were dead wrong. And Jesus walks up and he's outraged by it. They kill him. And I'm saying there's a lot of self-righteous and pharisaical ambition that lives in the American church. And how do I know? It's because because if the preacher mentions politics, people get wound up. Get wound up because I've talked about their God. 
And we let all sorts of respectable sins go on with no address. Sins of pride. Jesus died for that. He was crushed for pride. And it doesn't trouble us anymore. Passive, aggressive, whiny behavior. Jesus died for that. And we let it go on. All for what? It's selfish. If I confront, the passive aggressive one will be passive aggressive towards me. And I don't want to deal with that. And see, we're not outraged, are we? Okay, we may be outraged with transgender. And we may be outraged with... Goodness, I could just keep going. But we're not outraged when Jesus is ignored. When he's not known on our street. When he's not known in our children or grandchildren. We're not broken hearted. But you mess with my country and it's go time. Say when. That is antichrist. That is anti Christ. So the lack of crying among his people is an indictment. We don't really know his heart as we say we do. Why are we more troubled? Excuse me, why aren't we more troubled? When churches give themselves to political talk, action, over personal holiness. And I want, I want that to land on us. Why do we get so wound up over one and we're by and large indifferent to the other? May God have mercy on us and draw us back into his presence and to know his true heart. And we'll cry for the right things. We'll weep. And we'll cry and cry and cry until we have no more voice over the lingering unrighteousness among his people. Over the proclamation of the wrong message. Over the defense of the wrong freedoms. Again, if 2020 is not enough to bring us to our knees. What else are we waiting for? What would it take? 